And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. Yeah! I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Gehenna Gaming currently developing Eldric Automata, a, me a mecha meets horror affair using the Year Zero engine. The one and only Nick Francia. How you oh, doing today, thank man? you. Thank you for getting my name right on the first try. Like, that is that is great. And it's, uh, you don't know how many times I've had to, like, correct people in the last, like, month. I appreciate that. Oh, I've... I will simply say that given my actual last name, I can relate. Um, I'm guessing that people assume there's some fancy-ass way to say it when it's really a case of sometimes a log is just a log. Yeah, a very. Much, they like to add, like, an H. The, the worst, and the, the one I get often, is people call me, like, Franchia. And I, it's just like, uh, that's that's not it. Just to say it how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. It's... Ex it's not it's not like one of those ridiculously long long names like or the names of certain towns in Wales. <laughs> it's it's exactly what it looks like. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's just it's just uh, keep it simple, you know. And I mean, it, it's not like um, <laughs> it's not like Hubert Blaine Senior who <laughs> who has <laughs> the longest name ever used. I'm about to say no. I'm not like the third. You know. Oh, I wish. What? I can't even pronounce that. That is that is so wild. Um, for anyone that I, I just typed in Hubert Blaine Senior. For anyone listening. Yeah. Um, and that is like a twenty tw twenty six character name. That last name. That is that is wild. Oh yeah. no, it's more. What? <laughs> That's ridiculous. How do you even? Okay, I'm I'm gonna get too much in this hole if I keep if I keep digging anymore. So yeah, I'm just going I'm just going to send you the full name ac according to Wiki and and um le and leave it at that. Yeah, that sounds like a that sounds like an old tour in its own sense, right there. That's what. The... Imagine getting roll call for that. <laughs> Yeah. How are you doing today, Mildred? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am. I am good. I just. It's one of those things I ha I had to bring up because, on a whim, I was like, okay, what's the record for the for the most ridiculous last name? And there, there it is. Technically speaking, the longest word in the English language is the chemical name for tetan, but that isn't usually counted because that's more of a chemical code. Yeah. Oh. There's been pl there's been plenty of ca of cases like that, but I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, this is a long story. So, funny enough, um, I was very interested. I my first system ever, like the first books I ever bought, um, I stumbled upon packs when when fourth edition of D, &D was for, first coming uh, up first coming up and um penny arcade was doing like they're they were starting up acquisitions incorporated so it was like the very first time they had done it um and i had heard it and i said well this sounds really fun i've heard dungeons and dragons let me get them so like my birthday was coming up i was like 13 and I, my you know i begged my parents to get me like the three book box set um which, funny enough, I don't even know if I have anymore. It's a little sad if I because I don't. But uh, that that's kind of where it started. But the first game I ended up actually ever playing, um, because you know, gathering a group is is hard enough. Is I went online and I ended up playing uh, Mage: The Awakening, so New World of Darkness, which is now known as Chronicles of Darkness. I'm still calling it New World of Darkness. And no, <laughs> no one is going to stop me. I think that's a good way to, to you know distinguish for the first edition of that and second. There are multiple editions now, so yeah. And I, I know, I know some might say the official the official name is Chronicles of Darkness, but to, but 
To that, I will reference the line that I keep referencing from Avengers. I acknowledge the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid-ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. <laughs> See also why I, why I pronounce a graphics interchange format with a G and not a J like the creator of that format claims it should be. Oh, they, they say uh, GIF instead of GIF. Yeah, I always pronounce it GIF. I don't, I don't think I'll ever pronounce it. Well... Way quote-unquote right way it is a bit of spite on my part because the reason why he he said it should be with a j is quote choosy programmers choose gif <laughs> ridiculous so on but... the basis of him doing it as such a stupid pun i will i will refuse to out of pure spite there you go just uh i i acknowledge your uh i acknowledge your 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 sense to humor by stating your opinion, but I'm asserting my authority by ignoring it anyway. <laughs> Pretty much. But, but yeah, I started with Mage, and then, funny enough, uh, the like first long-standing campaign I ever got into was, do you remember the old Marvel phase rip system? Yeah, For I've co I've covered it on this channel, as well as some of the other Marvel RPGs and the ups that's and downs awesome. through it. Yeah, and that by far that's the only Marvel game I still have ever played. Like I refuse to play any Marvel game that isn't Phase Rep because I just have really good memories, even though that system is very complicated. Um, oh, back I, to cov D100. I covered. I covered. I don't think. I don't think it's an issue of complication. I think. I think it's an issue of um, front loading. Yeah, I've, no, for sure. I've covered some of the stuff that's on Classic Marvel Forever, which is a nice little um, yep. rabbit hole. As well as um, write-ups, which uses DC heroes, but it's the, it's the same kind of rabbit hole. Especially if you, especially if you need to look up the stats of any given um, superhero. But there was a project called Nth Edition that was attempting to that was attempting to streamline some of the jank. Because keep, keep in mind when the when Marvel Phase Rip originally came out, it didn't even have character creation. When the, when just the, when all the throws was just the core book because TSR stupidly thought that people would just want to play as characters in the Marvel universe. Um, you saw a similar problem that happened with the Indiana Jones TSR game, mm -hmm. and both and both got hammered for the for their lack of character creation because of that assumption. Because I've I've said the way I've described it is nobody wants to play as the X Men. They want to play as a student in the Xavier in, in the Xavier Institute. Yeah, very much so. I I remember getting started, um, and I'm pretty sure I was start. I we played advanced Marvel Phase Rep because I because I'm looking at because because Marvel Forever actually you know for anyone that hasn't been on Classic Marvel Forever they actually have all the old books and PDFs. Um, I mean, they're they're not exactly the cle they're not exactly the cleanest um, scans, but. When you're dealing with books that are 50 years old, you take what you can get. Yeah, very, very much so. Like 1980s, so it's it's some pr it's a pretty old system, you know. It's especially for TTRPG years. Mm -hmm. But and then and then finally from there after playing, and I played in that game for like five years. Um, and then going back to fourth edition, I ran a 4E game for my friends. I was. You know, I started out as the GM among my friends. Um, and then through there, that kind of planted the seed in me to like want to go out and play more TTRPGs. So I've been playing, I'm 30 years old right now. So I've been playing uh, TTRPGs and GMing for around 17 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Eldric Automata is a year zero game. Yes. And when I looked at Gehenna when I did look at Gehenna Gaming, if I'm not mistaken, this is Gehenna Gaming's first full on book because a lot of what I saw was actual plays and adjacent stuff for World of Darkness in general and Vampire in particular. Yeah, to kind of give a little bit of the backdrop, um so Gehenna Gaming was conceptualized, and this is before I even joined on, as a um, kind of like a like GMing, like professional GMing service, mm -hmm. uh, very much focused on like World of Darkness, specifically Vampire. So I think the initial thing was to run Vampire Epic. So like a multitude of games that all connected over each other. And that was like the kind of original mission statement. And then from there, it kind of branched out to doing conventions. And then we kind of rebranded as like an event um, 
we'd like we'd run games at cons like officially and we'd like procure like gms that, to be able to run games at cons uh and then the pandemic happened and everyone was you know cons weren't really a thing um and i think what really started us to make our push is that we decided to do virtual horror con which is i want to say one of the first if not the first virtual convention in the pandemic because it virtual horror con ran march 2020 so literally like two weeks after the country uh the united states anyway for anyway if anyone's listening not in the united states um shut down and we got the con going up in like two weeks and it had panels and it had uh you know actual plays and games and everything and it was a lot of fun um it was a lot of hecticness and we've ran it two more additional times since then and we've learned a lot um but we we've always been about telling good stories and you know enjoying and, and running games um and so when i joined on i've actually been writing this game since 2017 uh it started out as sort of a like mecha hack that I was running to play, run an Evangelion style game with my friends in. Now, when you um, say Mecha Hack, are you referring to the ha- the Mecha version of the Black Hack or something else? No, no, no. So actually, it started out as a Powered by the Apocalypse hack because at that time, that was kind of like the, I don't want to even call it the new hotness, but for me, that was like what everyone was playing. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll build this in Powered by the Apocalypse because this is like a lot simpler. And so the first kind of proto edition of this game is a kind of like advanced power by the apocalypse game. Um, and through my testing of like that initial kind of run, I, I realized two things. One, I realized that this was something that was really cool um, and not a lot of games touched or explored, you know, between mech and horror. And two, I liked the combat was just not going to work in power by the apocalypse, you know, power by apocalypse has a lot of strengths to it. Um, especially narrative strengths, which I loved. And, you know, I still tried to kind of carry that over into the, you know, what the iteration of the game is now. Um, But I knew for a game focused around mechs and fighting monsters that we would need a more comprehensive mechanical combat system. And there was a a few iterations and blueprint plans because originally I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll go the D20 route because, you know, 5e was big and every everyone was like well what about a fifth edition version i was like maybe and then i discovered the year zero engine uh about late 2019 or uh, early 2020 with alien rpg um, I, alien. I somehow knew it was going to be alien yeah so alien is my favorite movie of all time uh, i love that series uh i could talk for hours about that uh so if, if anyone ever wants to talk about alien me just hit me up mm-hmm. um but from there, I really liked how the system was. I liked how it wasn't... It was easy to get to, but it, it, it had a lot of mechanical depth to it. I think that's always, like, my preference of systems. Like, systems, to me, should be easy it's easy enough to teach to someone in within, like, 10 to 20 minutes. Um, but potentially a long time after to master and kind of get into the weeds of some of the deeper mechanics. Low floor, high ceiling. Exactly. Uh, oh. And then t- 2021 rolls around, and I had already been considering, like, oh, man, it would be really cool to make this game in uh, year zero. And I was like, well, maybe I'll just release it as a free hack or something like that, like just a simple text document. And then Free League Publishing, they dropped uh, the open license for year zero. And yep. I remember being like, this is my chance. So I brought the idea to Gehenna Gaming. I said, look, I already have a framework for this game. The mechanics are already essentially done. I'm just going to port it over to year zero right now and kind of adjust and fix things. And Ian was like, yeah, go get the mechanics done and then come back. And so I pretty much wrote the first 50% of the of the book, the manuscript, uh, by myself, just, you know, lowly reattaching things from this mass of like multiple documents that I've just accumulated over the years. And I finally presented to Ian. He said, "This, you know, this is good. Let's let's go ahead and you know throw some money in it." Um, so we paid out of pocket to get our entire manuscript done. That was very important to me, as I wanted to make sure that the book was in a near as complete state as it could be. Um, so by the end of the campaign, I could just release like an Ashcan edition to all the backers, and they could just jump in to play the game and then wait for the pretty book later. Uh, and that's kind of what brought us to the Kickstarter here. So I always tell people like. Full transparency, like our writers are being paid out of pocket. 
Uh, we wanted to make sure that wasn't something dependent on the funds. We are kickstarting for publishing uh, costs because books cost money and shipping costs money. And then art because art's very expensive, especially if you want a lot of fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and even more so when you're doing something specific. Yeah. But and it's... We, we, mm -hmm. oh, go, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say we got very lucky in finding our main, our lead artist, uh, Geo, Michelle Manning. Um, and Geo is a whiz at just making mechs. Uh, he actually 3D models them before porting them over to 2D. Um, so that's the the cover that you see on the Kickstarter. He did all that. Um, and his vision has been really awesome. And and so we, we very much lucked out in finding an artist that was very much kind of attached to what we wanted to do so far um, and had the experience. But... You know, if you want something done right, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be willing to shell up for it. So, this is this is us trying to put our best foot forward, which you know some people call it's it's a lofty goal. I completely agree with them. We knew we knew it was going to be an uphill battle, but I'm excited that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to point out is what you mentioned when it came to realizing that po that powered by the apocalypse wasn't going to work. That ties into something of a of a pet peeve I've seen within the tabletop discourse of acting like a, acting like a certain game can run just about anything even on, um when it's not a universalist system exactly because and even mm -hmm. there's like I've I've seen people I've seen people say oh you can use fit you can use 5th edition to run any kind of fantasy yeah, except if I want if I want to do something a bit more um a bit more eastern leaning all all the house rules that I have to do it stops be it stops it starts becoming just its own game in and of itself which I'm in good company with that but th but um the sheer amount of stuff that I'd have to do for for that it is not is not tenable and I know some people will say just to just um reskin some stuff and I'm like no not for not for some of the stuff that I'd intend. Mm -hmm. Um, and the same the same certainly applies with Powered by the Apocalypse. It's if you want to do something nar um narrative centric where um combat is just seen as another part of narrative and not its own focused thing, PBTA is fine for that. Um, you can make it a bit more combat intensive if you want. I know. Dr Dread of Night does that, but you are get, but you are going to be dealing with an uphill battle doing so. Yeah, it very much is, and there there are, and it's a very different style of combat. There's a really good system out there that I love. It's one of my favorites called Voidheart Symphony, mm -hmm. um, and essentially I call it like a more advanced power by the apocalypse because there are multiple move sets that are used whenever you get into combat, um, and it's very expansive than your usual like you know six moves, four stats, that's it. Uh, but even then, like to get the back and forth of like initiative and rounds and turns, that's something that the game can't do. And I, I do agree with you that, you know, I, I am not a huge fan of just universal systems in general. I mean, you know, I have love for GURPS. I like Cypher uh, and Gumshoe a lot. But even those, I, I feel like if you want, if you have an idea of a game in your head, like... Um there are so many other systems that are fine-tuned towards it, you know? I'm not entirely sure if Gumshoe could be considered a universal game. I guess um, it's like a universal mystery engine, right? Because it's like yeah, all investigative, but... It is very much skewed towards investigative, and Kenneth he Kenneth Hid outright, outright, outright said so when it came to answering why he made it, was because he was frustrated with how other games would ha were handling investigation. So mm -hmm. he decided to step in, and, and I uh, mm -hmm. something like Savage Worlds is obviously going to have a pulp leaning, and Cipher is go Cipher has is is a is a crunch medium affair, and of course the opposite end of the extreme is stuff like GURPS and Hero, where that's a rabbit hole. If I go down, I'm not coming back out. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I, you know, just for, like, uh, clarification, I love Gumshoe. Uh, Fear itself is on my top five TTRPGs of all time. Um, so these are systems that I've played a lot of and I, and I love very much. But, yeah, even I agree that there's... 
you don't i was just having this conversation yesterday with someone about how um not every ip needs its own individual ttrpg um because some stuff is so general that there's already systems out there for it and it's like yeah you could use 5e to run anything you want but that will it run well you know probably not well, if you want, if you want an example of someone using Five E in in something that it probably shouldn't have been used for, I know, I know some people are gonna are gonna cry foul about this, but the but the Dark Souls attempt with that um Steam Forge did with Five E, where not only was it the wrong system system to go with, and I'd argue any system that is class based should not be used should is a poor fit for Dark Souls. But also, they created problems that didn't need to exist when they decided to combine health and stamina into position, which yeah, was and, an unforced mm -hmm. error, and they got blasted for it. Those type of games, like the the Souls like games, I that's something I don't know if it's if it's been um, if it's if that code has been cracked on because that gameplay is very much based on like your reaction times and like dodging and stuff. And like, it doesn't work in five E because then it just becomes like kind of a generic dark fantasy game. Um, Cause you know, five E is made for that very much like turn back and forth combat simulator. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's possible to have a souls like experience in it TTRPG. Is, it is. I've seen it done. I've seen it and I've seen it done very well. However, the key thing that I will always argue though is if you're if you're trying to use any game that has a class system, and I am including Powered by the Apocalypse, even though some of its adherents would cry, would cry foul about that. Oh, playbooks play, are, playbook are classes. Yeah, you're right. Playbooks are classes. Deal with it. Is the is the fact that Dark Souls even even though you have it you have the appearance of classes in character creation, in reality those aren't classes. Those are just starting packages. The yeah. equivalent to a pregen, and if you're if you're built around a class system, it's not going it's not going to work. And I'm not I'm not saying go the GURPS route because that has its own issues. Um, but I but I've covered my fair share my fair share like say, um, like say for. Um, Fragged Eternum by by Wade Dyer as part of his Fragged series, which leans more Bloodborne than Dark Souls, but still, but is still within that framework. Yeah, I love um, uh, I love I love Bloodborne though, so that's I'll have to check that out. Yeah. There there's... and of course, of course, um, there's the upcoming project When the Moon Hangs Low, which is very promising on that front. I think it can be done, but you have to. There are certain default assumptions that people have about TTRPGs that you have to get out of when dealing with that. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with any other um, IP adaptation that you're do that you're doing. There's a um have you have you heard of Rune? I ha I have. I just haven't put much focus on it because Rune is a solo yep. um game. I so I really like Rune, um, but I will, and I think that's the closest I could say has gotten to a Souls like experience. But it's very much tailored to like, like, like you said, it's a solo game. And so I don't think that ha that has its own, that has its own problems. I I will I will argue that it, I will argue that it can, that trying to trying to adapt the gameplay specifically is going to lead to disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, trying to trying to adapt the spirit of the concept is where somebody should be going. Uh, you know, much in the, much in the same way that if, and I, I had, I had roasted the Power Rangers RPG for making this exact same mistake because that game was trying to replicate, was trying to replicate the TV show. What it should mm -hmm. have been trying to do is replicating the world that the TV show takes place in. And, um, stuff like Avatar Legends has that exact same problem. You know, if you're tr trying to rep nobody, nobody who's picking these kind of things up wants to do the exact story that they've seen in the source material. 
And, no, it makes sense. And to bring this into Mecha, I've, I've often said that the one Gundam series that ha that has the best possible fr that has the best possible framework to use for a TTRPG is not is not um the original Grandpa Gundam himself, but something not far off in the Eighth MS team. Mm -hmm. Because because that's just one story of many that could have been told during the One Year War. Yeah. Um. Uh, Whereas a lot of the other stories are a little bit too specific, there's also there's also the fact that everybody's gonna want to be in a um, mech, as opposed to having that one person who's the guy in the mech. Yeah, that's funny enough that uh that that is something that uh, we've talked about a lot for um, Eldritch Automata on how to like you know balance out mech and then out of mech mm -hmm. uh, gameplay. Um, and that was that's honestly one of our like biggest principles, though, um, is making both sides of that equation fun. Yeah, so I'm I'm guessing that with now first off with Eldrick Automata, um, mm -hmm. since it's using the Year Zero engine, I'd like to do a little bit of a lightning round. With yeah, year, with um, I'm going to give you a few names of other games that use the Year Zero engine, and you you can tell me if um if you're familiar with it through through play or or something else. Or if, or if it's something that you are not familiar with, and obviously Alien is going to be off this list because that's a little bit uh, that's a little bit too obvious. Yeah, and Alien, I'll I'll admit Alien's like as of right now probably my favorite um, published TTRPG. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I'd like to say my own, but it's it's not published yet. So, yeah. well. <laughs> but uh, and I I will note that this isn't the first time that somebody has done Alien in TTRPG form. But the other one, I'm not running again unless I'm paid hazard pay. Oh, though isn't that the one from the eighties? The nineties. Like, yeah, I know exactly and what you're talking that about. That one was using Phoenix Command's rule set, and this was around that time when everybody had a massive, massive boner for making things as simulationist as possible. Yeah, and I believe that company very much too. That was leading edge, and all they did was just buy IPs and kind of just cut carbon copy. Well, I don't. I don't remember if any other games tried to. They tried to do this whole IP, IP slapping when it comes to when it came to Phoenix Command. I just remember that one, and of course there was the Alien board game that I had back in the day, which was a more affordable way to play Space Hulk. Yeah, <laughs> you know, instead instead of paying like two hundred or three hundred dollars because Games Workshop wants to squeeze you for ev for everything, you know, put up put out Space Hulk for the first time in decades, but make it a limited release so they can jack up the price oh but so go so going down the list um blade runner yes have played mm -hmm. and jammed mm -hmm. all right coriolis uh have played planning to run mm -hmm. yeah I'm, pro I'm probably gonna be running that myself later this year um forbidden lands Aware of, uh, have made a character and never played. Mutant Year Zero. Have played. The, technically speaking, that one's the OG. That is, yeah, that's the progenitor. Mm -hmm. Tales from the Loop. I uh, have played and have run. Really, and I'm just gonna say also things from the flood. Yeah, I I I was putting in that particular umbrella. Um Twilight 2000 3rd edition. Uh I have I have the PDF for it, never run it yet. I'm very interested in it. I like the hex crawl. I like hex crawl. So Yeah, and Twilight 2000 is a variant of the rule of the Year 0 engine. Um and it's it has the gall to use the lonely D12 because D12s have been neglected by the gaming public. <laughs> Like for one of these days, I, one of these days, if I can find a voice actor to help me out with it, I will. There's a sketch that I've had in the I've had in my back pocket of doing a doing a parody of of the of those ASPCA sad ad, sad ads we all saw yeah. as kids, just with um D, just with D12s as the subject matter. You know, for seven cents a day, you can bring it. You can adopt this D. You can adopt this D12 so it has a home. 
<laughs> oh. Touched by the gods. Ooh, never have heard of that. We'll have to look into it. Yeah. Um. The Walking Dead universe. I have played one, like one very short demo uh, of it. Mm -hmm. Um. War stories. Never heard of it. We'll also have to look that up. Yeah. War stories is a is something that came that came across right shortly after the um after that after that SRD came around for the year zero engine. Yeah, I'm seeing it is, a, it is a World War II, it is a World War Two spin on the concept. Um now with that in, with that in mind, I have I did some digging around to see if I could find if anybody had tackled the idea of Mecha in year zero and so far I have so far I haven't found any I'm not gonna say that nobody else has just that I haven't found it yet so we we actually met up with a creator who is uh Alex Clippinger who um was actually in the midst of developing one but there is very much like we've talked about it like um because we talked about collaborating and everything and theirs is very much like focused on like kaiju and more to the um non-horror side of things uh but he was he was kind of working on a framework um so we talked about like writing and collabing and vice versa but as far as i know those are the only two mecha ttrpgs based in year zero so i guess the i guess the other thing to dive into is what would be what would be a few examples of of say the append the appendix and as far as re as far as reference material that you get that you guys would um, draw upon, this is not far removed from like the inspirational media section that's in every World of Darkness, yeah. every um, not every World of Darkness game, but every storyteller sister ga system game. Obviously, Evangelion's um off the off the li off the list when it comes to ones we'd mention because again, you mentioned it already, and it's a little bit obvious. I mean, yeah, it's very much if, a major part, for though. fuck's sake. One of your tweets was. Opened with getting the robot, Shinji. <laughs> I did. I did remember responding to that on someone on the Kickstarter, because um, they were like, you know, something like I forgot what line they said. I was like, get, I was like, back the Kickstarter, Shinji, or Ray will have to do it again. Hmm. <laughs> it was one of the responses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even even going for sure, obviously. But um, I would also say a lot of the monster design um, was very heavily inspired by uh, like Resident Evil. Um, Pacific Rim was the main inspirations for the mech for the automatas because I wanted to make an automata uh, a mech that had weight to it, mm. um, and something that I'm not a big fan of in like Gundam and other like um, like anime mecha is that the like these thing these these giant what are supposed to be these giant like you know 300 ton war machines are like able to do flips in the air and stuff, and I really liked how Pacific how Pacific Rim every time the robot stepped. You know, you could feel the impact. It was slow, it was sluggish, but it was powerful. Um, and that's kind of how I wanted the automata to feel. I also am a huge fan of Godzilla. Um, and the whole idea of, like, the kind of destruction and, like, the reason and, like, the collateral damage and the kind of stories of the people that were left in Godzilla's wake. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen Godzilla Minus One that's listening to that. Great movie. I would definitely go check that out. Uh but Godzilla in general, I mean, I grew up with that with those like movies, so that very much was also lent itself to the uh, initial core concept of it. And then we have like a few other things, like Escaflone had very much inspired certain parts of uh, the mechs in different regions. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of like the psychological horror, a lot of it like from Pandorum was a big inspiration. And then just horror in general, I very much love cosmic horror. I very much love horror in general. Um, and this game is kind of like a complete package of everything I loved growing up. Um, I'd like to play a little game of buy or sell since you brought up Godzilla. Yeah. So buy or sell is a, is a little game I play on some, on some episodes of the podcast where you're given two options and you got to pick one. There is no third option. You got to buy on one. You got to sell on the other. Okay. Um, on one end, Godzilla minus one. On mm -hmm. the other end, Shin Godzilla. 
Uh, I would say buy Godzilla minus one, sell Shin Godzilla. And that might be a controversial opinion. Um, and I love Shin Godzilla, but it is very much its own different beast and its own different message. Where Godzilla minus one very much feels like going back to the original concept and the original like themes of the OG Godzilla movie. It is kind of funny you mentioned that since you talked about your love of cosmic horror and yeah, so Shin Godzilla is a yeah, he's an eldritch abomination, and Hideki Anno made Shin Godzilla, who also made even Galleon. Like, I love that movie, but as as a fan of the overall Godzilla series, I uh, Godzilla minus one might be the best I've seen out of Godzilla in a very, very, very long time. Well, well, up until this up until this point, there was the legendary stuff and the anime trilogy, which I do not want to talk about the anime trilogy. Yeah, I still haven't watched the anime trilogy because I've been warned away from it. I might eventually, but we'll see. And and I I actually like the legendary stuff. I'm I'm very open to things, and I feel like um, King of Monsters actually is a pretty good idea of what Godzilla is now. Um, and I I was getting arguments with people, and they're like, "Well, but da da da." I'm like, "Well, none of the movies really had that." So. <laughs> We 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 look at these some of these movies with like rose colored like rose colored glasses. And um, um, I I do I do remember someone someone trying to tell me that things were more grounded in the Showa era, and I'm like, no, mother absolutely, motherfucker, not. you are literally too stupid to insult with with that. I mean, but the funny th- the funny thing is, is for the longest time I was under the impression that. Evangelion was Anno trying to deconstruct the super robot genre, especially the super robots of the 70s. Yeah. When in reality, his in reality, it w- his focus was less on that and more towards um, Ultraman, which it, should have mm-hmm. been obvious in hindsight, given the given the power timer that the Ava units have when they're not connected to a power source mm-hmm. of so being three minutes. Yeah. You know the same the same rule with like the color timer in Ultraman. Well, I mean, even the Shin series in general. I mean, I tell everyone like, because because a lot of people don't realize that the very last uh, Evangelion movie is technically the alternate title of Shin Evangelion. Um, but like that, those are Anno's babies, and you can tell, and they they all kind of have you know similar themes into them. Um, but I, I Evangelion is such an interesting like byproduct though because it really is you can see that it i i do believe that it did start as like i I thoroughly believe it did it did start as like a deconstruction um but then it kind of morphed over time over the production of it because you you can tell that anno and and a lot of the other creators behind it they were really going through some stuff and you can see anno definitely was he's yeah been he's been very open over the years that he that um throughout the throughout the production of of both a of both ava both the original run of Ava and the run, and the run of the rebuild movies, he he was deal- he was dealing with um a with um clinical depression. Yeah, and you can very much see how the OG show is like a you could, you're seeing a a a, cre- a a creative breakdown in like real time in front of you, and I think that's the kind of beautiful part about the like even going as whole and at the end. Um, is by the time you get to the end of it, you can be like, all right, like Anno has moved on past even going and he he's learned his lesson. He's accepted some things and he's found happiness and it's very apparent for how that that last movie wraps up. Um, and yeah, I cry at the end of that movie every time. Yeah. <laughs> but with that now, with that in mind, getting into getting into the the mechanics of things, um. Corey, now the year the year zero engine games a lot of a lot of them kind of kind of lean into having a a archetype system not full on cl- not full on classes per se but age but a general a general theme mm-hmm. um usually usually with usually with um a key attribute and and with um, t- with tied with tied abilities, relationships, and the like. Um, more of, but it, but at the end of the day, a starting package. And I'm guessing that even if, um, 
Eldrick Automata is leaning towards the characters being pilots, there are different interpretations of pilots. Yes. So, uh, first and foremost, we've on our roadmap, funny enough, because we, we do have a future roadmap for future supplements and additional books, um, because we really want to turn this into a game line and not just a single one-off release. Um, and the first big thing we talked about is, all right, how do you play Eldritch Automata without pilot in the Atama and rather that have being the backdrop um, to everything. So that has been a, an intense conversation we've had in our last few creative meetings. Um, that being said, the way that the kind of system works for creating character, and it's something I really love that I, um, I really think people are going to think is special, is that you choose a pilot archetype and you choose an Atama archetype. And your pilot archetype is really much your narrative talents. Um, it's your narrative abilities your, that are, you know, enhanced through role playing, um, and how to navigate the world as, you know, as the character without the giant robot. Um, and it's not like, you know, it's when I when I tell it's like, okay, it decides what kind of pilot you are, but it really lists the kind of major, um, major theme or major trouble that your character has, or that that's kind of flavoring. Um, the kind of story that you'll be playing through. Like, one of the pilot archetypes is called the hyper-responsible. Um, and you play a character who's very much uh, has this idea that they need to be the one that does everything. They need to be the one that's in charge because they need to be the one that takes responsibility because it all falls on them. Um, and it's very much how do you play that character out and the talents kind of lend itself to being that and, 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 and doing that and uh, how, you know, that over-reliance or that pressure you put on yourself, how that hurts you in the long run uh, throughout war and throughout this apocalypse. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one being um, the sheltered, which is very much someone who hasn't seen a lot of combat or a lot of horrors of war, and how, you know, someone that's hasn't necessarily lost their hope or has lost their cheerfulness um, and how they navigate amongst, you know, uh, a party of other people that are more seen as realists and it's really interesting because in that like that those characters it's like okay one of the big things that you play out in that pilot archetype is well what happens when that happy facade starts to break what happens when you start to really see what reality is about like like how how kind of messed up everything really is and what that does to you um mm -hmm. And so I, I don't want to say all the pilot archetypes almost have a negative spin on it, but they all have a main, like a major question that they ask about your character um, and kind of give you an obstacle, which I think is good because I, I, you know, it does enhance you. We, there's this term that always gets thrown around in a lot of other games called playing to lose. Um, and I don't, and I don't think the characters are losing. So I don't like to say you're playing to lose, but I think you're, you're, you're you're playing with a you're playing with a weight on your back, mm -hmm. and it makes it you know it sometimes that weight can help you because it keeps you grounded, but but most of the time that weight is always on the at the back of your mind, um, and does make things difficult. But it 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 takes human people, you know, people that are not perfect to pilot an automata, which is it takes a, a special type of person and and someone that is, uh what I'm trying to think of the word to say, because I don't want to say like broken or anything, but someone that, you know, inherently has flaws uh, or it's some, like something that's like more humanity is what it takes to pilot these big robots. And then your automata archetype is very much like what kind of big robots do you have? Well, you know, what kind of powers and abilities do you have? What kind of, whether there are more weapons or like supernatural abilities. Um, and those are definitely a little more like positive and fun coded, uh, versus the kind of psychological horror that is your pilot archetype or your personal horror, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my like one of my favorite automata archetypes is probably the Overload, which is very much it is you play a giant robot that has a nuclear reactor built into them, and so you have to even though you're you know inherently a lot stronger than some of the other automata, you have to worry and manage uh, like your extra mechanic known as heat, where you're building up heat and heat, and you can start melting down. Uh, going into meltdown on the reactor if you push yourself too hard. Um, and then another one that is uh, known as the Legion, which is very much what if I was a slightly smaller mech, slightly like smaller mech that was accompanied by an army of very small mechs or machines or something like that. So there are different ways to play. Like you're not just playing a 
uh, standard like bipedal uh, giant robot. Like you definitely have a, there's a lot of flavors for everyone to try out, which, you know, 12 and 12, uh, 144 unique combinations, uh, even more so, you know, depending on what starting talents you have. And then the weapon system, all about customization uh, because people love making weapons. And I think that's a, that's a fun thing to do for your mech. Yeah. And the thing is with with mech, even even just going bipedal, there's a lot of a lot of variation that can occur with it that can occur within that. Oh yeah. So something I'm something that I'm curious about is how is how you're able to carry that without without it getting over without it getting overwhelming and going full um mecton plus yeah like without getting too complicated mm -hmm. is kind of what you're asking um yeah so we have the, the thing that kind of flavors the automata is that each automata has different um talents and the talents let you do cool things and abilities um and then every automata also comes what's known as a berserking state so berserk is a unique mechanic on our game and it really is where i feel like the power fantasy and horror clash um then actually like start to mingle a bit is you have this stat called ego that every character has, and it's your you know your sense of self identity, your connection of consciousness to the automata's unconsciousness, and your automata needs ego fueled into it in order to do uh, their special abilities, which is why stronger willed and more uh, you know worn down and tested individuals do better in automata than say someone that everything is perfectly fine with because. You know, and um, you know, challenges and and hardships build character is kind of like the old adage, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that ego, you know, as long as you have ego and you're fueling ego, like your automata feels powerful. That's where the power fantasy comes in. But eventually, that tank's going to be empty, and you start to, as the pilot, you start to kind of forget where you end and the automata begins. And when that ego hits zero, you enter into something called the berserk state. And each Berserk State gives a, the Automata a massive power boost, but it also gives you a narrative clause, and you don't recognize your allies. So your ability to cause more collateral damage and hurt the people around you, while also hurting you know the enemy in front of you, uh, just skyrockets. Hmm. And that's a really cool conversation. It's like, okay, yeah, we saved the city from a horror, but we also you know desolated half of it in the fight. So did we really save it? Um, and something that kind of gets called up in the, you know, the world state as it were, because we really wanted to kind of deliver a kind of sandbox state of the here and now to people so they could just start playing at it. We didn't want to put like a meta plot or anything like there is a history, but there isn't a certain direction that the plot is going to go. We just give everyone a bunch of tools so to kind of decide that themselves um, is very much. It's like, OK, what is the opinion of the pilots? Like, are the automata seen as saviors? Are they seen as more mo are as as big as menace as the as the horrors because that that's that's you know that duality opinion is something that would happen oh yeah and it's it's something that is ve is very is very important to to maintain mm -hmm. now with that with that in with that in mind uh, i'm guessing i'm guessing that a lot of the core setups are still are still going to be applicable here it's still attribute plus skill you're still shooting yep. for sixes yep. um you're you still have the opportunity to roll to re-roll with risk oh uh, yeah you push the, your yeah push your luck yeah pushing stress panic mm -hmm. uh that's all in the game because i think that works so well for what we wanted to do and we kind of took a little step forward but those those mechanics are in the game and you know they roll as they would in any other year zero engine. So kind of the coda has been mm. um, familiar, but new. Yeah. So to, fo to follow up on that, what are some, what would be, you already mentioned the whole oh, ego thing. So like, <laughs> what would be some of the things that are going to be specific to Eldrick Automata that aren't going to be in other year zero um, games, aside from the whole obvious parts, like, me like just having Mecha. Uh, ego, ego is a big thing. Um, and the the actual like what it's equipped to your mech ego field is a huge thing because it acts like an armor and it's almost like a scaling stat. Uh, ego is a an additional stat that's not in any other year zero engine game. 
uh, and is very much another resource to track. Stability is another big one. Um, there is no stability in year zero, and stability is your long-term mental health as opposed to stress, which is like your short term. Um, so like for anyone out there that's ever played year zero engine, uh, stress, you build and build and build. But after like a shift of time and peace time, your stress goes back down to zero because you've had time to kind of rest and relax and de-stress. Uh, but stability is actually more akin to your long term uh, mental being, which you see in a lot of other games, kind of like like Call of Cthulhu or any of the, these classic horror games. Um, so that's something that we've added as well. And then my favorite system is the strand system. So the strand system was actually a lesson that I took from a lot of the earlier Powered by the Apocalypse days, um, where those games always had a lot of about tracking your relationships with like other characters and NPCs. Um, so very much strands are the emotional connections that you have between other players and non-players. Um, and that could be that doesn't necessarily mean just like the good stuff either, because like it could be your friends, your level lovers, your rivals, your enemies um, in the latest play test, the campaign play test we've been doing. Um, one of the main antagonists has strands with every other player character. And it's been very interesting, even though they're all complete enemies to each other. Um, they know it. But, you know, sometimes your your enemy can have a big impact on your life and you can and you you form emotional connections with even people that you don't like or you might even hate um and these connections are all useful in kind of you know being able to kind of fuel your will and your determination down the line so the nice thing that strands do is strands actually have a mechanical benefit they give you enhanced dice um that you will succeed on or one or six and so whenever you kind of use a strand or you exhaust a strand you gain that ability. Now, when a strand's exhausted, it doesn't go away. It it, it's, it lies in that exhausted state. Um, and you can refresh those strands by spending a shift of time, which a shift in year zero is about five to six hours, mm -hmm. uh, by going to hang out with, by interacting with that person, with that player or that NPC. So it actually gives you downtime actions to like go and be like, let me check in on my friends. Let me check in on this NPC I haven't talked to around. Let me go talk to my rival or you know piss off of him and and have a scene with that and so what that ends up doing is that ends up rewarding role play um and not making it feel like it's just something for the narrative it actually gives you mechanical benefits because you can also potentially build more strands and because strands don't typically ever go away they're just a resource that builds and builds and builds over time mm -hmm. And what that also does is for people that aren't necessarily super into role play, it gives them kind of a reward at least to engage with the story um, and actually give a shit about these NPCs. Because it's like, oh, like, even if it's like I go use my time to hang out with this person, you know, even if that's as far as it goes, at least that's still happening and now occurring in the story. And, you know, that person, even if they are just like a mechanics junkie, they can look and be like, well, I have seven strands with this person you know, that I hang out with every week. So I guess I, I guess my character does refer to that character as a friend. And that's something that the character sheets and the mechanics have informed um, where, where the narrative would usually be the only way to decide that. Mm -hmm. So with that, in, with that in mind, um, in a lot of, in a lot, in a fair amount of year zero ga games, there's, usually a resource that the GM can use to make the player's life interesting. Mm -hmm. um, like, since I brought up Coriolis, I'll use that as an example. You have the whole concept of prayer, where when you're doing a skill test, you can reroll die that aren't sixes, but you're giving the GM one DP, which they can use to mess with you. Um. In the in the case of um, Eldric Automata, do you have something similar to that of just some sort of resource that the GM can use to work against you? So not on the GM side, because when you push in Eldric Automata, um, you gain stress. So that's something that's also kind of given back to the player. Mm. Um, and then panic is where the GM really starts to be able to pull stuff and have a lot of fun. Because, um, you know, if you panic... So, so nothing like a resource that builds and builds and builds. That is an interesting mechanic, though, because I have seen that in other games um, that they can kind of spend to use that in. But I mean, 
uh, stress and panic is huge because panic is really interesting because if you roll a panic, you don't necessarily fail your roll, but it's like, oh, you succeed, but... Um, and that help will help the kind of GM and players kind of inform the kind of like horrifying stuff, you know, when the shit starts to hit the fan. Mm -hmm. uh, which is always, a, that that's my favorite moment in any game and in anything is that there's always this moment where you're like, okay, the other the other shoe has dropped and, and the shit has hit the fan. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, given how um, Eldric, Eldric monsters in in various media can take all manner of form, then hell, just yep. look at just look at all the different appearances and tactics of the angels throughout the um, both both the original series and the rebuild movies. Um, do you plan on putting some putting some sort of um some sort of creature creation guide within within the core book? Yeah, so that is actually the last bit of mechanics we are squaring away. That is the last bit of that that I'm currently working on. Um, it's a part of what we call the Enemy Codex chapter, which mm -hmm. is basically gives you a like table of stat blocks for like a bunch of the seraphs and horrors um but also gives you the ability kind of you know how to make your own um and it's interesting the way that the enemies are designed is instead of having like a full stat block they have what's called the threat level and the threat level decides what they roll for everything so your horrors you know might have a threat level of five that means okay you need to roll something they're rolling five dice you know um, and then they, each of them have like abilities that can be tacked on to make them do like fun, like, you know, cooler stuff. Um, and then say something like the Seraphs, which are like your big boss monsters, they have anywhere between 10 to 15 threat level. Mm -hmm. So you knowing that you're going to roll a fistful of dice and that it's easy to reference and easy to remember um, just so that you're not constantly switching back and forth between the stat blocks and being like, oh, what do I roll for this again? Mm -hmm. There's just this number that you can look at and be like, okay, catch all. So, with with that in with that in mind, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the project? We've measured with art and everything three hundred plus. Mm -hmm. So that's because as of right now, with the mechanics alone, with no art, we're about eighty pages of text. Um, so I'm like thinking with the art plus the other half of the book that, you know, our writers that we like had freelancers, write, Uh, that's going to fill up very quickly. Um, so we're, we're looking for a nice tome, like a nice tome. It's going to be eight by 11 or 8.5 by 11. You know, your typical, what is that? A four size. Um, we really want this to be a book that could sit on your coffee table and have cool art for you to look at. Mm. Um, which is kind of what I like about a lot of free leagues products in general is that, they have that nice texture to it, and they also have a not a, a lot of beautiful art that you can you know can just kind of browse through, um, and that's also part of why like our Kickstarter goal you know we kind of set that higher goal because we we, we want to make something uh, nice, you know we want to make something that can double as that art book. Yeah, I can I can certainly get behind that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a general ballpark. So uh, Q2, um, Q4 2024. That was very important to me that the Kickstarter be in a state, that the book be in a state. So like I said, the manuscript's essentially done. It's like that 95% mark. Um, and we'll get that done within the next month or so. Mm-hmm. And then all that's rest left to do is art and layout, um, and which we've already started a bit of it. So the art's the main thing that's going to take us most of the time. But our idea is that we want to we want to release within the same year we kickstart. I I don't want one of the things I that I that I didn't want is I didn't want people being like three years down the line being like, well, when am I going to get this book? Or you forget about a Kickstarter and four years later it shows up at your door, and it's like you know that's nice. That's nice to get that surprise sometimes. Um, but I really want this to be something that like people are anticipating and like hopefully around October, November, that's what we're aiming for. People are going to get the game and be able, you know, to play it. Um, and that being said, with the mechanical like uh, Ashcan that we're releasing, 
um, at the end, at, if, when the campaign funds to our backers, I mean, they're going to hopefully have been playing the game for a while uh, up until that point, but then they'll finally have the finished product and be able to kind of uh, admire the whole thing as a whole. And then hopefully by that time, we have, will have already been also partially starting on our next supplement. Um, our D, we've, we've played with a lot of how the releases should be, but we really do want to uh, stick to at least the, if we're successful, obviously, um, all things plans can change, but uh, a supplement a year, mm-hmm. at least that at, at the very least. Yeah, and I can I can certainly get behind that. But with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. Yeah, no, come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Uh, you have been awesome. Your questions have been awesome. Uh, I do have a question for you, if that would be all right. If if, if you're not running out of time too much yet, I'm. Pr- I got time. So what what question did you have for me? So this is something we've been taking a survey. How do you feel about, uh, like a season pass kind of release of a TTRPG? Because this has been something we've been thinking about. Where you know, say you know that there are three adventures going to be released in a year, kind of like what Pathfinder did with the Adventure Path. And you could pay for all of them ahead of time um, and eventually get a big book of it containing like all three adventures, you know, and maybe they're, you know, act one, act two, act three kind of setup. Um, or you could buy them individually. But how do you feel about like a season pass, like beginning of a year, you know, oh, all these books are coming out this year. If I just get this season pass, I'll get all the books versus buying each each one individually. Um. I think th- I think that sen- what that what that leans into is something akin to scenario compendiums, which is nothing new for the Year Zero engine. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of bu- of buying now with the pr- with the promise of it of it coming down the road in that in that particular year. Um, honestly, I'd be I would be a little bit I would be a little bit iffy. Um, keeping keeping a public roadmap and the like, and let and letting people um, pick and choose, I think I think would be the better option. I'm not saying mm-hmm. drop the idea of season pass, but just drop the idea of um, of doing that doing that in ad, in advance the way video games do season passes and just yeah have, and just and just have a um just ha- just have a cl- a a compendium option that can be taken because I'd imagine with the individual modules they're not they're not going to be all, they're not going to be all that big it's going to be like say um, Hammurabi from Coriolis which is only like 12 pages <laughs> I, I always measure them to like um, the adventure paths and Pathfinder which these books were like you know 25 30 page books um, and there'd be six of them over across like maybe a, a year or two time span so like you would you would pay for them in advance and you would just get them at like individual points, uh, but no, I completely understand that. It's a lot. It's a lot and, to ask the people to buy in from the start. And the thing about adventure paths is that they are, is that the, is that they are effectively a self-contained season of some sort of show. Yeah. Like when someone's getting in it, when someone's getting an adventure path, like say. I don't know. Let's use let's use Kingmaker. That's always a classic. Um, you're getting like you're you're usually getting five adventures, and you're getting maps and support for each. You're essentially get you're essentially getting five module box sets in digital form. Uh, with each with each part with each part of it, and eventually there, eventually there's a collection. Um, but the thing the thing is is that they're they're not ex- they're not exactly one shot leaning, whereas mm-hmm. a lot of modules and the like in the Year Zero system very much are. There's not a, there's not exactly a long form multi session thing. If you were if you were doing multi session type of adventures, you know st- stuff that's meant to stretch out like a mini like a season on a streaming show or something like that, I'd be a li- I'd be a little bit more amenable to the idea of a season pass. Yeah. And do you do you like the release of you know three scenarios that are very much three parts of the whole? Or are you more of a fan of one shots? Um, I think self-contained. There's, 
I think that there is room for both. I mean, Gargoyles had the whole tears and tent pulls thing um, way back in the day, and I wish I could say I came up with that term, but that was an internal term to compromise fr um, networks that wanted to be able to just put episodes in any order they want. Networks really, really don't like serialization. <laughs> and the solution was, okay, you can put these in any order, but only between these specific episodes that are airing. Oh, hence the name Tears and Tent Poles. Mm -hmm. The... I think I think that there should there should be room for both, like if you want to do if, but it's one of the it's one of those things that should be leaned into. Um, I think if you're going to do a season pass like thing, it should be it should be treating a given a given game, a given a given um camp multi session campaign like a season, of, mm -hmm. like a season of a television show. Yeah, completely that's, agree. That's kind. That's kind of what. That's kind of why um, I find it interesting that you would bring up that because there's there are there there are some um, arc ba arc based modules within within some of the um, Year Zero library. Um, just to use Coriolis as the recent example, they just finished yeah. the. Wake the wake of the icons, uh, not wake of the icon, mercy of the icons, um, which they uh, has like emissary lost and all that in there, right? Um, yeah, em emissary lost was part one, part two was the last cyclade, and part three is the recently released wake of the icons. Um, so I'm trying to I'm trying to remember if for if um if um for, I don't. I don't think Forbidden Forbidden Lands had a, had anything like that. Um, I think didn't they have what was Raven's Purge? Because Forbidden Lands was Raven Purge, right? And wasn't that a well? That was like a, just a huge campaign book, I think maybe. Ra yeah, Raven's Purge was was a camp was a was a big campaign book, and that thing yeah. was two hundred twenty five pages on the PDF. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, like. The po the point is is that if if you're gonna do the if you're gonna do the season thing that is something that leans more towards a story more towards a story arc series of um sessions rather than a one shot. Yeah, I think that doing a season that's consisting of a bunch of individual one shots would not be the best idea because even even with those scenario compendiums. Um, some scenarios are going to better fit a given table than others. Absolutely. So you, so if you end up, you end, if you end up paying for like five, for like a compendium that has five different one shots and two of them don't fit the particular story you're telling at your table, well, that's two, those, are the ones that you're not telling, that's, um, a waste in that sense. Yeah, I'm not saying, not saying a full, not saying a full on waste of money. Like I'm pulling some hyperbolic, so I'm not. I'm no, no, I, I, I get what you're here. saying. It, they're just not, they're not the right fit for the table, mm -hmm. for the themes. I, so, I totally get you. And I, I realize that this is certainly a question that I'd imagine a lot of people have a, um, X or Y answer. But I try to take a nuanced approach with this kind of thing because I know that I know that there's always a bunch of moving parts with these things. I was, and, well, I, I respect that, uh, that opinion. So, if you had to summarize my attitude, is that if you're going to do a season pass, do it for, do it using the Pathfinder Adventure Paths as a template, or Mercy of the Icons as a template. Yeah, that's that that's the, kind of what we've talked about. If, like I said, it, nothing's in stone yet. If but you we've just... if you want to see a if you want to see a big example of this kind of thing at work, I refer you to the Enemy Within campaign as it's been done in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Fourth Edition. <laughs> you know, where that where th that was the thing that they released over the course of several years. Yeah, and e each major section was was the adventure itself as well as a companion book. And the companion books are optional, but the, but they definitely have their use. Um, and e and each each one could be considered its own, its own arc or its own 
little um di little disc or se or season. I you probably noticed this, but I te I tend to use I tend to use a bit of TV jargon when it comes to how I present um stories, whether it be episodes or seasons. Or I, I do the same thing or series for my for my Brit Bong fans. <laughs> um, series one, two, three, and five. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. I know. Some will say it's it's not a season; it's a series. And I'm like, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it sure as hell ain't a goose <laughs> or gray duck. If you're in Minnesota, <laughs> don't ask me why. That's just how it works. But. Well, well, thank you in indulging my curiosity, at least. Like I said, I'm always yeah. trying to ask that question um, because I always feel like people, you know, that that's that people's opinions and, and you know, their respective yeah. um, viewpoints on things really to kind of do bring it to life. That's not to say I don't I don't think one shots wouldn't wouldn't have their place, though. Um, depending on depending on how the world of Eldrick Automata is framed, you could reframe them as in, as individual missions. Um, but that, but, um, that is, that's something that's going to be out of my particular ra range of, um, influence. That being, that being said, I do think that it, that, um, when it comes to one shots, doing, doing some sort of annual or bi or biannual compend compendium of a given, range of released one shots would be something to to consider because some people are going to want to have those kind of things at, at their um disposal yeah at their sh at their shelf especially if they're especially if they're running um stuff at like at like cons or at their FLGS you know friendly local game store yep full agree so there's multiple I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna say that my suggestion is the best way. That's just. That's just my interpretation, based on what I have in front of me. Mm -hmm. Well, I honestly, I think it's it's a respectable one, and I appreciate you let me know and and, answer, and allow me to ask you that question. Mm -hmm. Well, my crusade has my crusade has been to expand the hobby in whatever way I can. It's what I've been doing for almost ten years now. We are uh, we are definitely in a renaissance, as it were. I, I thoroughly believe, um, you know, despite what what others might say. So I, I think the hobby has never been in in a better place than it has been now. Just don't just don't tell Ben Riggs that, otherwise he, <laughs> otherwise he might end up reing again. Because <laughs> oh no, you probably saw that little post he did about the golden age being dead. And I I you know, and that's as as someone that's a mean D and D fan, I can see why they might think that. Although I think five E, you know, I I guess from a from a D and D centric standpoint, like yes, as in it became like more globally acceptable. Ex um, except he didn't. Except he didn't title it that. He titled yeah. it the golden age of TTRPGs, and that it. And to that, I had, I have the attitude of don't complain about getting stung when you swing at a hornet's nest. Yeah, I I, I very much think that it, that uh, that opinion is is based on a long-standing problem that a lot of people have understood, and, and even we kind of touched on it here, which is you know forcing everything to fit in five E. Mm -hmm. But I also think that could be another you know episode in itself of of, of me and you, or, or and people that are better, well informed on the subject than I could ever be. Well, we um, are in the temple. We already covered that when when we tackled his yeah. gold, his golden age thing and just ripped it a new one. And we also looked in the comments, and nobody's taking him seriously. <laughs> like like I said, I, I I feel as a person, you know, looking and thinking, okay, like this person plays a lot of D and D maybe that's all they've ever played. It might seem like that way. Um, but I feel like the reality is very far. Yeah. far and from it. I've always held the policy that every, that, um, you're into that. You're in that. Um, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to have it be unchallenged. Completely agree. Especially if you put that out there on, on the public internet. Yeah. You know, I because I've I've told people I don't care what their opinion is. I, I care about why I should why I should agree with it. I.e., sell me on it, otherwise I'm gonna eat you alive. <laughs> but because anybody anybody can say in my in my opinion, 
Fourie was trying Fourie was trying to be like an MMO, and um, and I will come in and say, okay, is that is that really the case, or is or is that just is that just a follow the herd kind of thing? I I will say I really like fourth edition, um, and I actually back it a lot. Uh, the one thing I'll say because I could get into an entire like three hour conversation about it is that four E taught five uh, E the most important lesson I think it would ever learn, and is and and one of the biggest improvements from five E from the older systems um, is that players should always have something to do on their turn, As, e, even you know. Spell slots being out, there should always be something you do you can do, and I think that's something that 4e delivered on, um, and that has been a staple now for D and D going forward. Oh, also minions yeah. are cool. <laughs> but i i've co- i've covered the i've covered that particular matter, and it's what it's just one of those things where i f- i I felt that people were making the MMO com- um, complaint most. Mostly, mostly out of mostly as a straw man, because this was mm-hmm. right around the time World of Warcraft was hitting its stride. Yeah. Oh, and I've to- I've talked about that on on other things, and I've I did I did a whole video where I was where I basically mocked the whole concept. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been, mostly because I heard this exact same thing back in third edition of it turning D and D into Diablo. Ignoring the fact that there was an AD that there are AD and D modules for D, for Diablo back in the day, but yeah, that's what to say. But um, don't Dusty Rose, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> but Very, rest in peace, the yeah. king. But th- th- again, thank you for coming on and a sincere yeah, thanks appreciate it. to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Stay frosty, everyone.